Hi, I am Professor Goodmanson. This video is intended for my students in my aircraft design class at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, where I currently teach. The video presents excerpts from my textbook, General Aviation Aircraft Design, Applied Methods and Procedures. Its purpose is to supplement my class lectures. The book is available online from a large number of outlets, for instance Elsevier and Amazon. It is recommended for anyone interested in the design of general aviation aircraft. This video focuses on the construction of the so-called constraint diagram. Like I say to my students in class, there is more than one way to create an aircraft. For instance, if a person really fancies a particular type of aircraft and is inclined to construct and fly it, the easiest approach is to acquire a three-view drawing of it, cover it up with a blank sheet of paper and simply trace it, perhaps scaling it to a smaller version of said aircraft. And if this person does not let ethics get in the way of referring to this effort as my design, then perhaps modifying a little thing here and another one there is a good idea. Fundamentally, this method would leave the wings, stabilizing surfaces, fuselage and landing gear layout intact, but might modify the wingtip shape or the curvature of the windscreen to leave one's own mark on the design. But it is important to realize that this does not represent an original engineering design. It is perhaps an original engineering copying, but original design it is not. All the hard work, such as the sizing of the wing and the stabilizing surfaces, their position in space and general geometry, the location of the landing gear and shape of the fuselage had already been done by someone else, and the copycat would not have contributed anything of value to the creation of said aircraft. The process of copying is easy. The original creation is not. And it takes a real engineer. A true engineering design requires a true engineering process. There are many ways in which this applies to the aircraft design process. One of the more powerful tools is the so-called constraint diagram, but it is the purpose of this video to demonstrate how to construct one, how to read it, and what it all means to the new aircraft being designed. So consider this scenario. You're a professional aircraft designer and are approached by a potential customer who says to you, I want you to design me an airplane that does this, that and the other thing. Let's say, for instance, the customer wants you to design a light sport aircraft, an LSA. This automatically puts a regulatory stall speed constraint of 45 knots calibrated on the design. The customer might say, I want the airplane to cruise at 140 knots true at 10,000 feet. I want it to climb 1,500 feet per minute at sea level. I want it to carry two people, be capable of a service ceiling in excess of 20,000 feet and be able to take off in less than 800 feet at sea level conditions. Of course these requirements could be stated in a much more structured and detailed way, but we are trying to keep things simple here. Is it possible to design an aircraft that satisfies all of these requirements simultaneously? And perhaps you notice that the requirements are very different from one another, implying complex interrelationships. This can hardly be easy. However, the answer to the question can we design such an airplane is yes. It can be done and this is the way we can do it. So what we do is to create a two-dimensional graph where the plane spanned by the two axes is called the design space. The horizontal axis is the wing loading, that is, the weight of the aircraft divided by its wing reference area. The vertical axis represents the thrust to weight ratio. It should be noted that the vertical axis can be used to represent other properties of the design. For instance, it could be power in newton meters per second per weight or brake horsepower per weight or simply thrust or shaft or brake horsepower. While such labeling is helpful in the later development of the constraint diagram, we always begin the process using the thrust to weight ratio. Now the purpose of this graph is to allow us to plot the thrust to weight ratio as a function of wing loading. 
This representation befuddles some newcomers to this method, so the best way is to think of the horizontal axis as the x-axis and the vertical axis as the y-axis. Therefore, when I say that the thrust to weight ratio is a function of wing loading, regard it as me saying y is a function of x. And yes, granted it can be tricky to come up with expressions that lend themselves well to this process, although many performance related expressions can be transformed relatively easily into such thrust to weight ratio equations. So let's say that we come up with an expression that describes the thrust to weight ratio for a desired rate of climb as a function of wing loading. Therefore, when we plot this curve on our constraint diagram, it might look like this, where the solid blue line represents the combinations of wing loadings and thrust to weight ratios that yield a rate of climb of 1500 feet per minute, as desired by our customer. Thus the wing loading shown would be associated with the shown thrust to weight ratio and the resulting rate of climb would be 1500 feet per minute. If the wing loading is higher as shown, it too would have an associated thrust to weight ratio and the rate of climb would still be 1500 feet per minute. This shows that the curve is in fact an isopleth, that is a curve of some selected fixed value. It is analogous to an isobar. Now, it should be evident that if we choose a combination of wing loadings and thrust to weight ratios, for instance as shown, the resulting rate of climb will be greater than 1500 feet per minute. Most would consider this an acceptable turn of events. However, doing so would be akin to selecting an engine capable of greater thrust or power than we need to meet the 1500 feet per minute rate of climb requirement. This would not necessarily be better, because such an engine would most likely be more expensive, heavier, and consume more fuel than necessary. We are searching for an optimized solution here. By the same token, if our combination of wing loading and thrust to weight ratio is below the curve, our rate of climb will be less than 1500 feet per minute, which is unacceptable, because it will not meet the requirement. In general, combinations above the isopleth represent acceptable values, rendering the region acceptable. Similarly, combinations below the isopleth represent values that are not acceptable, rendering the region unacceptable. Let's consider another performance parameter, sustained turn, also known as constant velocity turn. It is a maneuver in which the aircraft is banked to some desired roll angle while both airspeed and altitude are maintained. It is a desirable property in the design of surveillance and aerobatic aircraft. Again, being above or below the isopleth dictates whether the combination is acceptable or not. Note that a combination of wing loading and thrust to weight ratio in the left part of the graph may meet the rate of climb requirement while failing the sustained turn requirement. Also note that by superimposing the two isopleths, the acceptable region is being reduced in size. Let's consider a third property. This could be the takeoff distance. Again, combinations above the isopleths are acceptable and below are not. Now, it is of importance to realize that these two corners are of great importance as they represent optimums, in particular the left lower one which represents the lowest wing loading and thrust to weight ratio that meets all the requirements. It is the true optimum. We would be wise to consider that combination the one to pursue in our design. Thus, by plotting the constraints in this fashion we can easily identify all combinations of wing loading and thrust to weight ratio that allows all customer requirements to be met. Consequently, if we can hammer out a reasonable estimate for gross weight, and granted it is not always easy, we can determine both the required wing area and required thrust, giving us an idea about what sort of a power plant we need for our new aircraft. Additionally, knowing the wing area, we can identify what sort of a high lift system the airplane must feature to meet the stall speed requirements. In the next part of this video, we will look at a number of useful formulas from my book and use them to plot the constraint diagram for the aforementioned requirements.